All right, everybody, welcome to episode two of the World Map Podcast. I'm one of your hosts, Josh, and joining me, as always, is your co-host, the Nelson to my Murdoch, coming to us straight from Hell's Kitchen, Clark. Hello. <laughs> actually, you're, you're not in uh, Hell's Kitchen this week. You're, uh, you're actually, are you broadcasting live from a classroom at an undisclosed law school somewhere in Pennsylvania? Yeah, somewhere it <laughs> A particular university of the state. <laughs> <laughs> interesting, interesting. Uh, and joining us as always also is Alex. Hey, how are you? Doing well, doing well. And joining us again for the second time is the man with all kinds of fear, Nick. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. How are you guys doing this week? Pretty good, pretty good. Just, uh, I don't know, a few glitches because yeah, I've been traveling. That's why I'm here, obviously. So I thought I'd be really prepared, bring my Vita, bring my 3DS, but I forgot to charge the batteries for both. So I got about, no, I got no time on the Vita and about 10 minutes into playing uh, Stretch Mo, the battery died, so I couldn't even try that out. Isn't uh, Stretchmo that new free-to-play experimental game that came out on 3DS? Am I thinking of that right? Yeah, you're thinking of it right. It's it's basically like a sequel to Pushmo. It's kind of a block push-pull puzzle game, and it's it plays almost exactly the same. At least the first few minutes I got to play. Interesting, interesting. Well, you know, last week we talked about Ether One, uh, and and Nick mentioned that he he tried it out. It, it sort of reminded him of like a 90s PC exploration game, sort of like Myst or something. And he mentioned a lot of good things about it. He, well, I don't think he necessarily <laughs> mentioned good things about it. I think that it just wasn't for him, but that it was an okay game. But I played it this week, and Nick, I think you went a little easy on it, actually. I've only got like 10 minutes in the game, because it was... Oh, just... all right. So your opinion doesn't count. I have... I, have, <laughs> I give I you an couple... initial... Experience and told you I didn't. It's not my type of game. <laughs> well, it's it's certainly my type of game if it were actually good. Uh, I I tried quite a bit of it, and honestly, I don't think that game is really ready for prime time. I I think it's it's certainly Sony should be a little bit ashamed that they made it part of the PS Plus offering this month. Uh, that game just doesn't feel finished. I love the concept. It's a great idea. It reminds me a lot of a Portal game, which I love Portal. Portal 2 is probably in my top 15 games of all time. Uh, but to start out, they forgot to include an option to invert your Y-axis. I mean, it's that's, not a plane game. I don't know what, why you need that. That's a freaking sin, man. <laughs> sin. If, you, if you grew up in the 80s playing video games and, and like in the 90s with early like joysticks and things, I mean, you got to have that invert Y-axis. That's how real gamers play. I'm sorry. <laughs> so, but you know, uh, the teleport system. So the game actually has this mechanic where you're you're in a dream world, trying to reconstruct memories of uh, this mental institution of sorts as clients, and you're reconstructing memories from within their dreams or something like that. And then you can teleport back to the real world and place items that you find on shelves and. Eventually, you get to the point where you want to teleport back and forth to grab items from different places and, and make them interact to solve puzzles. Problem, I got about a couple hours into the game, and the teleport system freaking broke on me. Like, I'm pushing the teleport button. I restarted my game. I did everything I could possibly think to do. Couldn't teleport out of it, so I was just stuck because I needed to actually teleport to finish the puzzle I was on. Uh, reloaded my save. I tried everything I could. Went online, found a lot of other people are having problems with bugs in this game, getting stuck in environments, so on and so forth. Um, so basically, my review of Ether One is like if you tried to make a portal game, but you don't actually have any programming skills. I don't know. I think you're a little easy on it, Nick. I mean, like I said, I only had about ten minutes, and I just couldn't get into it. So maybe I didn't run into all these problems you had. <laughs> Maybe yeah. maybe it was intentional. Maybe they're just trying to make some kind of commentary on the current state of AAA game releases and how they're always given unfinished now. Maybe. Yeah, well, they, maybe they certainly commentary the heck out of that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just... 
sarcastic. So that's one of the defense. games I played this week. I did actually was able to. I didn't get to play a ton this week, but I actually over the course of the weekend, in between housework and stuff, I've had a decent amount of time to play some this weekend and catch up on some things. But I'm interested, uh, Alex. Uh, what did did you play this week? Um, I've been playing uh, Valkyrie Chronicles on uh, the port for the PC. I don't know if you remember that game. It was on PS3 about like five or six years ago. Uh, strategy RPG with like cell shaded Japanese anime graphics. Uh, but yeah. yeah, I was playing the port last uh, couple days and it's been pretty good. It holds up pretty well. Is that a turn-based JRPG? Yeah, it's a turn-based, and then like when you select a unit, it goes into like a uh, shooter-type mechanic, so it's kind of a hybrid. Interesting, interesting. Yeah. It's on yeah. sale on Steam for like six bucks, so like why not? Yeah, yeah, why not dust that one off? Did you uh, did you get a chance to play that economic game that you teased everyone on last week? <laughs> no, I looked at more YouTube videos, and I think I'm gonna wait because right now it's still in the beta phase, so. Uh. I'm going to wait until they actually complete the game. There's there's a lot that's missing. Single player, campaign, stuff like that. There's some multiplayer, but it still needs some work. So <laughs> so speaking of multiplayer that needs work, I tried the <laughs> Assassin's Creed Liberation. Uh, it's the PS Vita Assassin's Creed game that came out a year or two ago. Oh. Uh, I tried the multiplayer on it because I looked at the trophy list and I said, hey, this actually seems like a doable trophy list. This might be my next platinum. Uh, I'll knock out the online trophies first. I hate when there are online trophies, but, you know, I'll, I'll get them knocked out first. I started the multiplayer. What the heck? I actually uh, platinum that, that game last year, and I still don't understand the multiplayer. I read about it, and uh, as far as I could tell, you just click through menus and hope for the best. And then I, wait I, hours. I don't even know where to start. It's worse than Farmville. It's literally just clicking. It's like tapping the screen haphazardly. So I'll try to explain it. There's basically there's a there's a world map and it's it's like a, a globe of the actual Earth. You choose a city you want to start in. You get bonus points supposedly. I don't know where the freaking points are uh, for choosing a hub near your own home. It geolocates to you. So I think Richmond is the closest place to DC. I I don't know why I don't have DC on there, but um, so I picked that. And basically, you tap a city, uh, then you tap some little swords that take you into an attack mode, then you have all of these characters that all do the exact same thing, you tap one of those, then you get the choice of three defenders in that city to fight. Um, as far as I can tell, they all do the exact same thing, you choose one of them, you click the fight button, uh, the game sort of has this little animated gif of a guy swinging a sword for like a couple seconds, and then you get a couple of points for, I don't know, for, for, for winning, for killing the other guy. I'm not sure what exactly happens. Um, apparently, it, it's, it's sort of set up as though your character has energy points and that you're spending those by fighting the enemies, but I'm able to fight enemies when I still have zero energy points. I have no idea what's going on in this multiplayer. It makes no sense. It's not even really a game. Um... From what I was able to gather is the points you can get that you actually need for getting the trophy, you don't really get so many points if their energy points are at zero. You actually get more from the battle if, they're, if they have some energy points, and you have to wait to let that recharge. Um, you actually don't have to fight. You also can have them set up to defend, or so, there's one other option, but I don't really remember what that was. But they play out exactly the same way. If you set them up to defend... It's basically the same as attacking, except that you don't do anything. There's no animation. You just come back later, and it's like, oh, you defended. Yeah. And yeah, then you get a few really, points. It's really pointless. I can't wait to finish it. I have two of the three trophies. At this point, I'm just grinding to oh. level 15, however long that's going to take. Uh, One thing I found with that game is the single player also is really glitchy. Um, if you mess up on certain ones, like climbing a certain number of buildings, you have to restart from the beginning. So I don't know if you run into that or not. I haven't even started the single player. At oh. some point I will. It'll take me a while it's, to finish the multiplayer because it's something that I just kind of put in my lap and tap along while I'm watching TV or something. And right. Someday I'll finish it. Yeah. Hey. So Nick, what have you been playing this week? I've been playing moving about four states over. <laughs> it's pretty fun. 
it's, it's really so it's kind of like Catherine. Like <laughs> <laughs> moving boxes. <laughs> Almost Even like the, the Oregon Trail that I drive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's well, I, I, I had a chance to, to... Turn... go ahead. I was gonna say I did turn Destiny back on. I turn it on, you know, every now and then. Play a bit of it. I do enjoy some of the modes of it. And they brought Team Doubles back, or Double Skirmish, which is probably the only mode in that game that's awesome now. You get a buddy, and it's just it's like. Classic like Halo team doubles, but the new House of Wolves expansion is coming out soon, and they bought a bunch of events coming in. So I wanted to check some of those out, and uh, that that's about it. Move in and just a little bit of that, maybe a uh, turn back on some Mario Kart Eight there, and started trying some of the new DLC tracks, catching up on some of them. I haven't got to try much of them. No. That's, that's about it. Ma- mainly moving on. <laughs> so we we talked about Torin last week. I I just beat the game about an hour ago. Wow. It's wow. only about a two-hour game. I started really? it after lunch, and I had already finished it. And is that it worth was the game price, that though? Uh, is it worth the price? It depends on what kind of gamer you are. I think the game was about seven ninety nine, so uh, it's it's not bad. If you're someone like me who really enjoys like trying indie games just to see what type of creative things people in other countries or like at smaller studios are coming up with, uh, then then definitely it's worth the money. Uh, if you're someone who likes a lot of really polished games and you want to get some length for your money, certainly not the game for you. Uh, again, you know, only about two hours. That's the game we talked about where you start out as a as a baby and you literally start out as a baby. Your your first controls that you learn are crawling along the floor. Uh, and you age as you climb this tower to fight a dragon at the top and and sort of free yourself from this curse. Um, That curse being that it's kind of an eternal daylight, um, so it's sort of fried out everything outside the tower. There's no other life, and you're trying to bring back night, essentially, bring back the moonlight uh, by defeating the dragon and, and, and ending this curse. And you actually, as part of the curse, can die and a sort of statue of your body then forms in the tower, and you start back down at the bottom again. And that's kind of how the, the mechanic goes. So there's no there's no real death mechanic. Uh, as far as challenge, the game's not really that challenging. The puzzles are pretty easy, and the combat sequences all follow the, pretty much the same sequence where you hide behind, like, a statue while the dragon is breathing in your direction, fire or wind or whatever, trying to blow you off a level, and then you just sort of leapfrog your way up between statues to get up and fight the dragon. Um, I really like the concept. I like some of the things the game is trying to do. I would love to see a studio with a little more skill uh, take an idea like this and build on it. Um, the whole the whole idea of this, this journey over the course of someone's life climbing this tower really cool, but in a two-hour game, it doesn't have much impact. It's kind of like you go from being a, an infant to an adult really quickly, uh, and there's just not that much chance to do story and, and character development. And the game looks like crap. I mean, it looks it looks like early PS2-era graphics, probably. Uh, but again, I found it interesting and, and intriguing, and, and I enjoyed some of the things that it was trying to do. So depending on, on how much you like indie games, that might be worth checking out. I don't um, know, two hours. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, it, it only takes a couple hours to play through it, so it might be worth a look. Um, how's, how's Heroes of the Storm going for you, Alex? Uh, pretty good. I don't know. I, I, I basically play to get the daily quests, and then I kind of, like, hop off and play something else. But uh, it's, it's still kind of fun. Uh, I, I mean, like I said last week, basically you got the games where you're just kind of stopping the other team, and then you got other games where the other team's stopping you because just the roll of the dice as far as how skilled your teammates are. So, I don't know. It's one of the cons of all MOBAs, so you kind of have to just live with it. Yeah, I mean, last week, or, or I guess in the, the week before, uh, before last week's show, I had gone 3-0 and in the matches that I played, Felt really high on the game, and then this week I jumped in to try three of the free-to-play characters that I hadn't tried yet: uh, Sergeant Hammer, Jaina, and Thrall. And just my team lost miserably, went 0 and 3 this week. <laughs> and I and I really just like 
I, I kind of, I don't know. I mean, the fun of the game now for me is to log in each week and, and try out the new powers for characters I haven't tried before as they become available, because that, that's still kind of fun for me. But the actual playing of the game is just not fun for me anymore, because I, you know, there's the, like, the map in the mines where the objective is to go gather skulls in the mines so that you right. get a stronger golem that can take down your enemy base. Uh, no one on my team went in the mines in, in a match yeah. that I was in. I was the only guy yeah. down there, and, and it's like, you realize we cannot win. Like, it is just impossible. There's nothing... Doesn't matter how good you are. Like if these guys have a 100% golem, they're taking us down. And that's uh, right, right. I mean, if it was just a quick match feature where you're just playing with random people always, I don't think I could keep on playing this forever. But they do have that ranked match feature, and everyone who plays that has to have at least 10 heroes, which implies that you played for a very long time and you know what you're doing, at least to an extent. And then you get matched up with similarly ranked people. So I guess the better you get, the better your teammates will get and the better the games will get. At least that's the theory. So what I'm going to do is just keep on playing until I get to that point, and if it's still bad, then I'm just going to quit. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think I was thinking a little bit of the same. You know, Hopefully it'll get better as, as I rank up and get higher. I'm only level 15 right now. I think you were at 35 last I, I saw you logged in. Yeah. Um, I, you know, it's going to be a slow crawl for me because I'm probably going to play few matches a week with everything else that I want to try to play, but, you know, it's it's fun. It's like StarCraft and Hearthstone. It's fun to jump in and do a match here and there when you don't have a lot of time for other stuff, so I, you know, I still think it's a good game, but I'm, I'm definitely uh, less into it than I was <laughs> during the beta, and the game hasn't yeah. launched yet. It's, it's still a good game to just jump in for, like, 15, 20 minutes. You can get a game one or two every day, and you don't have to invest too much time, so... Sure, sure. Speaking of, of matchmaking, you know, I, I tried uh, the Helldivers expansion this week, so it's called Turning Up the Heat, and, uh, you know, I'd mentioned, I think, on a previous show how much I love Helldivers and, and think it's it's a great game. I Helldivers is still my game of the year so far. I At this point, you know, we're about halfway through 2015. I still think Helldivers is the best game that, that came out so far this year. Um, and the Turning Up the Heat expansion is great. Uh, new stratagems, which are the gadgets that you call down to, to fight enemies with. Uh, new weapons, new enemies. They added some heavy, kind of tank-like enemies for some of the aliens that you fight. Uh, new environments and new trophies as well. And this is a completely free expansion if you own Helldivers. Uh, it should, you know, if you have your PS4 in rest mode, it should have already downloaded the update by now. Uh, really good. There's also a new paid DLC pack out for Helldivers. Uh, it's the, the second Reinforcements pack. I actually bought the first Reinforcements pack because there was a really cool gadget called a Guard Dog, which is a, a drone that goes in your backpack, and he flies around and helps uh, add a little extra firepower during fi firefights. Uh, I, I don't know if I'm going to get Reinforcements pack 2. Uh, it adds some new classes, but none of them seem like something I would play more than the class I'm currently using. Uh, but, but man, Helldivers is still great. I still love to jump in and play a match uh, every week or so. So if you guys if you guys happen to download that, we got to party up. I can show you the ropes on, on Helldivers. It's good stuff. That's on uh, PS4 and Vita. Um, so I, I'm going to skip over talking about Marvel Heroes but uh, f for the most part, but I am at level 20 in that now. I uh, played a good portion of that some more yesterday, getting really deeper into the crafting and the skills. I'm finding the auto party system is pretty good, although some of the missions uh, are a little broken. Like if your party member uh, completes an objective and then goes back to Avengers Tower without you and you get to that area, I couldn't get the mission uh, to pop and finish for me, so I had to get out of the party and go back to that area. Uh, but it has that one more area, like I just want to reach one more level or clear one more area feeling that I got from Diablo, so I'm really enjoying uh, Marvel Heroes 2015 still. Um, I think I think some of you guys have played Counter Spy, right? Is that is that correct? No, I've not tried Counter Spy yet. Okay, so I, I think maybe I thought you had, because it was a PS Plus game, so maybe you just haven't had time to get around to that yet. Um, so I'll, I'll wait and talk about Counter Spy and Hotline Miami 2 maybe after you guys have had a chance to, to play those. Uh, those are games I played a while back. I wanted to bring up at some point once you've played them because uh, they're both pretty good uh, and we could have some, some discussion there, I think. 
So let's move on from uh, what we've played this week and talk a little bit more about things coming up that we're excited about. And uh, we talked last week about E3 being around the corner. I would be really surprised if at E3 we don't see something about virtual reality because there's a lot of VR headset stuff going on out there. Facebook owns Oculus Rift now. Sony's developing the PlayStation Morpheus. HTC has said that their Vive product will be out by the end of the year. And we know Microsoft has, has demoed a little bit of the HoloLens. Um, it's funny because this is called the, the I'm So Excited segment. But, man, I'm not excited at all about VR. What about you guys? <laughs> um, I think it depends on the kind of game. Um, back when I was a kid, actually, I went on a trip to Vegas and stayed at uh, one of the hotels actually had a virtual reality game set up there, one of those old 90s ones where you have to wear the, all the equipment inside of the little circle thing. And it was a Star Wars-themed one, and I thought that was the coolest thing I had ever done in life. And well, yeah, so, Exactly. Yeah. And so whenever I heard about Oculus Rift and then um, Sony's uh, uh, Morpheus, um, particularly since I have a PS4, that one really excited me, I started thinking back, it's like, maybe this will actually be even better than that because it'll have, you know, modern graphics instead of mid-90s graphics, but with, you know, and all the great HD right there. And then also I thought, I think it'd be really great for if you're a horror game fan, like imagine playing a... Wait, did you say a, a horror game fan? <laughs> yeah, if you're a horror a game, you know, like of Silent Hills or the oh, Resident horror, Evil. Horror. Okay, sorry, yeah. I thought you said a horror game. <laughs> I mean, that I could probably play more be Japanese fun as well. With <laughs> <laughs> Arguably, the VR headset would help with that, too. <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah, but I, I, I don't know. I think uh, the kind of immersion you can get from that in, say, a, an older-style Resident Evil game would be um, very fun, uh, actually very scary. Um, just even from what I've seen other people playing and their reactions during the demos of simple little things like roller coasters and whatnot. Yeah, no, I mean, you certainly have a point there. I just, I, you know, they tried doing 3D back in the day. It didn't work out. And then, like, we had this little 3D revival <laughs> when Avatar came out, and Sony started trying to sell 3D TVs, didn't really work out for them. Um, <laughs> I think 3D is kind of still alive in the in the theaters nowadays you know for you know Avengers has a 3D version out there a lot of movies do but it, you know I still don't feel like 3D has has really caught on in the way that you know post avatar a lot of people were clamoring for it too and I just don't think we're we're there yet you got to keep in mind these these VR headsets when they do come out even if some of them come out this year and early next year they're going to be generation one, right? So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not expecting a lot from them. I, I guess maybe that's part of the reason I'm not excited. You know, I think back to the Virtual Boy that Nintendo came out with when we were kids. That was um, certainly certainly this will be better than that. But um, you mean this isn't all red? So. <laughs> yeah, yeah. At least this will be in color, right? And and like you, I've been in some of those kind of fully immersed um, VR environments that, that were available before in like malls and, and, and Vegas and things like that, but I don't know. I don't know. Maybe this isn't that. I, I haven't tried any of these technologies at, at, at trade shows like some folks have, so I suppose I should reserve judgment until I've tried them, but I have this, this deep feeling in my gut they're going to be too expensive for mass adoption initially, and they're not going to be the, the Star Wars holodeck that, that we really <laughs> wish we had. I mean, we're living now in what is the future in Back to the Future, essentially, in, in terms of time period, and we still don't have flying cars or hoverboards or any of that cool stuff. So I, I just hope hey, the that, shoes exist. Yeah, those shoes, shoes are coming out. Well, because they relaunched them. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I don't know. Well, I, I, I'm hoping for the best. I'm cautiously optimistic, but I'm not, yeah. like, clamoring for VR because I remember, like, when motion controls came out on the Wii and with Kinect and, and you know, with PS Move and things like that, I, I just, I like kicking back and playing a game with a yeah. controller in the traditional way. Here, here's my opinion on the subject. Um, like, with motion controls, the problem was they tried to tack motion controls onto a lot of games that didn't need motion controls. You, they have to, the game has to be designed from the ground up with that in mind. And um, 
I'm assuming if you take those experiences and assume that they're going to do the same with the VR headsets, then yes, that's going to be absolutely ridiculous and it's going to be a big failure. But I'm cautiously optimistic that they have learned from those mistakes in implementing motion controls and will actually tailor games for the VR experience. Um, I know there will also be updates to patch older games for that, and I, I think those probably will not be so successful. But um, like, I guess another example of something I think that would work really well, and you could still have a controller in your hand, would be, say, a racing game or um, a flight simulator game. It'd be really cool. You could still have the controller or some kind of control stick. You're controlling your craft. But instead of looking out of the cockpit on a screen, you can actually look out of the cockpit and look around in your cockpit, and I think that would add an extra layer of immersion. So certain kinds of games, I think, would uh, lend themselves very well to the technology, but other kinds of games certainly would not. Like I would not play a uh, like a platformer in VR. That sounds like it'd be ridiculous because you'd still need the controller to move around anyway, and that would break the experience. That sounds pretty awful, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I saw I saw something like a demo about that where you're um, it's like OCR in a time or whatever, um, where mm -hmm. you're Zelda or first person, or like first person Mario and stuff. I've seen various demos with that, but I think we also have to consider that people can't play for a long periods of time with VR just because of the motion sickness aspect. And there's been so many complaints about that. You can't play more in like an hour or two before you start getting dizzy or whatever. Cause just because the the uh, simulation of moving when you're not moving, and yeah, yeah. There's another right. aspect of VR that we that hasn't been mentioned yet. Something I'm kind of hoping doesn't happen. Like I know JDE or Josh, you're not really excited about it yet, but I'm hoping it, it doesn't go the way of like the. Xbox One's Connect or anything, where at first they're trying to push for it, and there's not much much backing for it. Like, nobody really wants it, and so they just kind of drop it. They drop all support, and so it doesn't really get a lot of love. And certain things that could have used it, like what Josh talked about with a racing game, where it could be a cool experience, just won't happen because support just fell, like, almost immediately. I'm kind of hoping that doesn't happen. Because I'm like you, I'm a little excited for it, but I'm not so excited that I'm just, I can't wait. But I'm also hoping that it doesn't just lose support so fast that it actually never comes to be. Well, and, and gaming certainly has a history of that. I mean, look at the 3DS. You know, the, the whole reason the 2DS exists is because you got people who, A, have kids who can't really handle the 3D so well, uh, and, and you also just have a lot of people who would rather save a few bucks and not even have the 3D effect and, and, and buy the 2DS because, frankly, a lot of games don't even utilize the, th the 3D, and if they do, they don't do it well unless it's a first-party yeah. Nintendo title. Yep, that's me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Although the, uh, the uh, new 3DS, though, actually, something they should have had from the beginning, um, they finally have that, I guess, a, c a camera that senses where your head is so you don't actually have to hold it into a sweet spot. It will adjust the 3D for you. And that actually, that's, now I actually play my 3DS in 3D the majority of the time, but prior yeah. to that I couldn't. And those are the kinds of iterations that I think we'll see with VR. It's only going to keep getting better, right? So, so just like Nintendo has improved upon the 3DS and released the new 3DS and improved that 3D effect, I'm sure, you know, Morpheus and Oculus and Vive and HoloLens and, and whatever else comes out, whichever ones survive in the marketplace and get a second iteration, it's only going to keep getting better. So... Probably not a day one adopter myself, but but I'm I'm certainly as you mentioned, you know Clark, you, you've got the PS4, and, and I think we'll both be keeping our eyes on the Morpheus to see, uh, you know certainly if Sony even mentions it at E3, will be interesting to see. All right, so I'm going to move on and call in the news motorcycle. <laughs> and I. Not a huge news week, necessarily, um, but the first thing I'll, I'll talk about, uh, in just in case your your iPad that you're on at, at whatever percent now hold up in an undisclosed <laughs> location in a classroom dies, but I got to talk about, you know, Clark, while you're on, on, on the air with us, Nintendo World Championship announced for the first time in, what, 25 years or something? going to be at E3 this year. Yes, I am excited, <laughs> and I actually plan on competing. Um, 
you, you all may not know, but actually Nick and I, we both competed in 2010 in uh, the national uh, Wii competition at the time. Finalists made it all the way to the nationals, um, ended up getting just fourth place, but, you know, that's another story. And so I think this, for me, it's almost like a chance at redemption where maybe I can go through and actually make it all the way this time. And also, I've been trying to get a hold of that original NWC cartridge for the past eight years now, and I think if I can't find a copy of the original game, it'd be nice to take part in the actual competition, the new version. Um, what I thought was funny was the announcement trailer that they used to actually announce the Nintendo World Championship. Um, it was very, very cheesy, and in, in had a lot of... <laughs> yeah, it's, it's... Imagine some of the early Nintendo Directs that just made no... Well, that had all the weird things like non-specific action guy and bananas and then throw in a lot of uh, 80s Nintendo references and um, and a weird 80s montage video with you know some uh, raspy vocals and and just some other weird inside jokes that make no sense to anybody including probably people who work there and you get you know a nice Nintendo announcement video so. Yeah, sure, sure, definitely. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, uh, you need Fred Savage to to, yeah. to take that. Um, He's the wizard. He is. Yeah. Well, I think his his little brother was the wizard in that movie, right? Uh, was no, he? No, um, or was he the wizard? He took his little brother to compete. I thought. No. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. yeah, his little his brother. Real life oh, little in brother, the movie, yeah. He, he can totally yeah. solve the dinosaurs or something, <laughs> right? Something like that. Yeah. So is, is uh, someone uh, going to break out the power glove or something? <laughs> get in, get, get in the answer. Answer. If if, yeah. if I can go there, I will bring my power glove. <laughs> or I will buy a power glove, and we, you know we go together, gold team, just like in 2010, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. So what what happened when you guys were in the Nintendo Championship in 2010? <coughs> um, Clark. Oh, cool. Well, yeah. first, we'll, we'll, we'll start with the uh, regional championship, which was kind of interesting. I, uh, we, I got this email from Nintendo, because I was one of the few people that was actually on their newsletter, I think, at that time, because everyone was losing faith in them, etc. And it mentioned a competition. I thought, oh, this looks interesting. And I told Nick about it, because it was a team competition. I said, we should join. And he didn't really pay much attention. And then a few weeks later, I started seeing the scores coming out of the regional uh, competitions, and I was like, hey, we're better than that. I, like, I can get a higher score than that already. And so um, it consisted of uh, Mario Kart Wii, New Super Mario Brothers, um, Wii, and... Uh, Wii Basketball. Yeah, Wii Basketball and, and Wii Bowling. Fit and, yeah, something. And, uh, Wii Fit Hula Hoop. And so I just practiced time trials in Mario Kart so that I can get a really great time in Mushroom Gorge, and I found a way to trick the uh, game in the bowling to think that you're throwing it perfectly straight without having to do all the crazy stuff so that you can get perfect 300s every mm -hmm. time. And um, Nick ended got, up doing something to where he... I got super boss yeah. at the, the Wii Basketball. I was rocking yeah. new perfect scores to perfect scores all but the time. At the uh, regional competition, my Mario Kart uh, Mushroom Gorge time trial score was so good that the officials thought I cheated, and they you were on made their me. Console. How are you cheating? I know. Well, the funny thing is, they got a few of their officials to watch me individually from different angles, watch me do it again. They also the they also grabbed the head guy too. There, the main guy of the whole. Miyamoto. No, <laughs> I wish. <laughs> but th that's not the funny part. The funny part is whenever they were watching me there, I beat my score that they thought was a cheat to begin with. Legit. And so I was like, can I just use the new score since you made me redo it? They're like, no, we have to use your old score because that was part of the competition. And naturally, we uh, progressed to the finals there. So. Yeah, yeah. So what was and the then Nick, story? Nick, I guess, can tell the story there. Oh, what? You want, you want to know the final story? Oh, Nick. Nick, be gentle. <laughs> <laughs> it was not my fault. First there were five, off, you made me play right-handed, first off. There were five games. 
the first, what was, what was Mario Kart was the next to last game, right? So the first three games, we were in the lead. We had a pretty good lead to. And first. we had a handicap, by the way, because I'm left-handed, oh, yeah. and they yeah. made me play right-handed. Yeah, they threw a curveball during the comp during the regionals, and to be qualified for the top four, we played our respective games. You know, Josh had Mario or Clark had Mario Kart. He had a. Uh, Ball, bowling, Wii bowling. And, yeah. And then that hula hoop thing was like both of us. And then I had the basketball, and we both, no, we both had to do Mario, and I had hula hoop. And we, we were half and half. During the final four of the competition, they threw a curveball and said, well, one person on your team bowls half of the bowling, and the other person bowls the other half. Oh, no. Mark's left handed. I'm right handed. We're like, uh, how do we do this? He's like, well, you guys are going to have to just work it out. So we had to try to. We didn't get a perfect score that time, but it was just they threw a curveball at us. But anyway, regardless of that fact, we were in first with a decent lead, all the way up until the next to last game, Mario Kart, which and I like to call footage of the competition. Cause, which, because they changed the rules. <laughs> yeah, they changed the rules. First off, if you won Mario Kart, the other four games didn't matter because the points for Mario Kart were so far above anything you can gather in any other game. Yeah, but the Mario average Kart, points. Oh. Oh, I was, was going to explain the points real quick. Yeah, the average point spread between first and last place for just about any game was between 50 and 100 points, and they had Mario Kart set up to where between each uh, place would be a 1,000-point difference. So oh, wow. um, it didn't matter what your scores were in the other ones, really. And so, they changed it. Oh, okay. You can, you can go oh, ahead. No, I was going to say, and so, you know, time trials is what it was. That's a skill-based competition. Instead, they turn it to a four-person Free for all race. Oh no, not in Mario Kart. This no, rubber, that's not the worst part. Bending. That's rough enough. No, 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 JD, that's rough enough as it is. They not only did that, but they turned items on aggressive, oh, which was just the worst thing. I've, there were blue shells all over. I think place. I think Miyamoto was there behind the curtain pulling some triggers on you guys. <laughs> <laughs> he had the duck hunt dog over there just doing his little giggle. <laughs> <laughs> but no, what happened here? We had two rounds. I ran around, and Josh, you know, Clark ran around. And Clark went first, and he's like, his whole thought process, he's been playing Donkey Kong, because you know, he has bigger weight, top speed for time trials. He's like, I'm going to pick Toad, because he's light, good acceleration. I get hit, I'll be back in the race right away. That worked. <laughs> the complete opposite way. Everybody picked <laughs> Bowser, Donkey Kong characters. They hit Toad one time and just shot Clark into like walls and he got dead last and I'm not talking close he was no just, no it was bad it's, it was like half a lap behind but the worst oddly thing I'm was. in last and I'm getting bananas and the guy in first is getting boosts so. <laughs> and, and, and now we know why why the world championships is is your chance of redemption exactly, exactly. <laughs> the second, the second half of that, we would have probably got second or third if as I didn't as, get a little greedy because on my yeah. race you're not picking you gotta rock Luigi. So I'm actually in second right before the finish, and I get a boost. The guy in first is the same team that won first on Clark's round. So if I knock him to last, I will effectively have canceled out all of the Mario Kart scores because the guy in first would be last, we would be last first, the guys in the middle were switched. It would have canceled that whole game out, which is what I wanted. So instead of just boosting past him and taking the win, I was like, I'll boost into him, knock him out of the way, put him in last place. I didn't realize he had a banana, and he pulled it out last second. Knocks me in last, right at the finish line. Right at the oh. finish line. Oh. Out. You don't know how hard it is to stay smiling on national TV when you just saw your entire competition just fall <laughs> to the ground. I might have cried a little bit. <laughs> and the way they gave us the pri- the way yeah, they handed we out the prizes, the last game. too. We, we, we went through the last game, and we, we did pretty good, but we had already lost. The prizes... Just a quick rundown. First place got a sick trophy, a year of free Nintendo games, a plasma TV, a bunch of good stuff. Second place got, and they got to be in a commercial. First, second place got the trophy, games, and third place just got like a trophy. Fourth place, we were supposed to get maybe a medal or something, but they didn't yeah. give us anything. They didn't even announce us at the end. Like an hour later, we go up because other fourth placers were getting like Monopoly at least, and we were like, hey, do we get anything? And he just kind of turns around real discreet. He's like, oh, yeah, sorry, guys. Here's a Monopoly. He, he, here you go. <laughs> like, throws us a Monopoly. Like, I don't know. Combined, we have, like, control. four copies of uh, Nintendo Monopoly now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. That's awesome. 
so, you know, so people... Nintendo, obviously a Japanese company. Uh, there's been some some interesting news with some of the older game developers uh, in Japan coming out lately. And, the, and these guys, I'm talking about some, some legends. Koji Igarashi, uh, who is known for Castlevania. Keiji Inafune, known for, for Mighty Number no. 9 now, but previously Mega Man. And then, and then recently some news about Hideo Kojima, uh, who, out of Konami, and, and known for tons and tons of amazing games, including pretty much being the figurehead of the Metal Gear franchise, uh, but but this week some things were happening with with a Kickstarter launching for Bloodstained Ritual of the Night, which is a new um, well, it's a new Castlevania clone. Uh, Koji Igarashi is calling it, I think, an Igavania, uh, claiming some ownership of, of being the father of that genre. Um, but that Kickstarter, man, it it flew up past its goals, meeting a bunch of the stretch goals and. It looks really cool because it, it looks like it's going to probably play off of Symphony of the Night more than any of the other Castlevania games, which I think still is the, is the best Castlevania game. And oh, I, I'm really excited to see how Bloodstain turns out. And and the best thing about it all, you talk about cheesy Japanese trailers. I don't know if you guys saw Igarashi's trailer for Bloodstain, but it starts out. I mean, there's like a there's like a freaking tombstone and the lightning comes down and strikes the tombstone and a bat flies out of it and then it turns out <laughs> Igarashi and he's like drinking a glass of wine inside of this castle talking about like D- publishers told me no one wants these kinds of games anymore and then he like slams the wine glass on the on the ground and he's like but I know you do <laughs> and like all this stuff so, like it, it's just an awesome trailer I think Bloodstained is going to turn out to be freaking sweet um but then, but then you have, you know, same thing happened to KG and Afune. Like, he wanted to make more Mega Man games, and it's like Capcom was, like, for some reason just sitting on the IP, and he's out of there, and he's he's going to launch Mighty Number no. 9, I think, in, like, September, which is totally a Mega Man clone. Have you got, um, to, uh, have you got to try that? Did you, ha- did you donate any no, of that game? No, no, I haven't. I, I'm actually a backer. Clark King, you know... It says, I am a huge Mega Man fan. I do know they've done a lot wrong with the series, but I blame Capcom, not not the creator. So I backed enough to actually get the beta of that game, and it it's definitely it, it's Mega Man through and through. It's super fun, though. And they added some cool new mechanics, like that dash mechanic to try to, like, steal powers from the enemy. It, it, it's, a, it's a really, it's a solid game. It's actually, it's really fun. And I'm looking forward to the release later this year. I totally am. I, I can't, I I can't wait. I love these. I love these. You know, I I like some of the stuff that, that new and, and especially indie studios are doing certainly. But but man, there's a reason that those retro games and 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 some of the mechanics that they're based on just worked so well. And it's great to see people take those and, and iterate on them, especially when it's the the actual person who came up with it in the first place getting to work outside the confines of a bunch of people in suits telling them how to make the game. Um, really cool. And then, same thing at Konami lately. Um, Hideo Kojima has been, I don't know, kind of forced out. He's, he's gone. Um, he was working with, with uh, Del Toro on Silent Hills, which has now been canceled. The PT sort of prequel uh, thing that came out on PSN promoting Silent Hills totally pulled out of the PlayStation Store uh, and now they've taken Hideo's name off of all the Metal Gear stuff that's coming out, Ground Zeroes, and, and then the upcoming Phantom Pain game. My guess is Phantom Pain probably okay. It was probably pretty close to done before his involvement was was over with that game. But I'm sure it's only a matter of time until we see Kojima go to Kickstarter as well. Uh, but what what is happening with with all these classic like legendary Japanese developers that we know? Um, I have an idea, maybe. Um, a lot of these guys have a lot of great creative talents and such, but, um, I, now, I can't say this for certain, because I'm not as familiar with Japanese corporate culture, but I spent a bit of time in Korea, and their business culture is somewhat similar. It's very hierarchical and rigidly structured. And um, I guess with Kickstarter and these new modern ways where they can connect directly with their fans, it actually 
makes it a lot easier for these guys to be able to um, express their creativity and um, create what they want without having to follow the confines of their the rigid hierarchical structure of um, their companies, which is something actually kind of new. There's an in, there was an interesting documentary about how in Japan um, and to a lesser extent in Korea as well, uh, uh, younger people as well as certain older people are purposely trying to break out and follow along the, follow things along the lines of uh, how in the West and in the U.S. at least how we have a very nice, uh, robust entrepreneurial um, kind of uh, business culture, particularly the way mm -hmm. our startups work and such. And so it's just kind of a spread of that, I would say. But I'm not the expert, so. No, no, I, I think I think that's a, that's good insight, and and I think that certainly uh, could be could be the case, and and. You know why? Why? What developer, if they have the name that some of these legendary developers have, um, and they and they can get funded without having to involve a, a publisher, um, why wouldn't you? You know, I think probably more money. You know, more of a share of the money for them in the long run. It's like a music artist, you know, losing all their money to to the to the publisher in terms of of albums and stuff. You know, why not go direct to the fans? And it's just a Sort of a uh, economical revolution we're seeing with 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 crowdfunding right now, especially right. in the game space. Cool. So, you, so you guys gonna play some of these? At, Nick, it sounds like you're you're definitely uh, loving Mighty Number no. Nine. You guys interested uh, to, to play Bloodstained? Yeah. I'm, I'm yeah pretty... Is that what's Bloodstained? Can... Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, well, I was just saying I was excited for it. <laughs> it looks pretty sweet. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's Castlevania, or I'm sorry, it's it's. It's not Castlevania, you know. With right. It's an Egovania. I don't know. One thing I kind of like is that it's probably not just going to be on handheld. The the real annoying thing is just about every Metroidvania style game that has come out since Symphony of the Night, Symphony of the Night, has always been on handheld. But you can't really play them on consoles ever, which is kind of frustrating. Well, or there, even there is PCs. dust. There is dust. I don't know well, if you if you played dust. That's the that's rare. That's the rare case. Yeah. You know. I I totally. If anybody is a is a fan of of that Metroidvania style, and you haven't played dust, it was a, a game developed almost entirely by one guy named Dean Dodrel. Um, freaking amazing guy. I love dust. Great great combat. Good exploration. Um, a lot of like hidden little Easter eggs in that game, and and just. Just a fun sort of animation style, and and kind of looks like an anime. It's voiced kind of like an anime. Um, yeah, I love Dust. Um, so I'm gonna move on then to the next segment that we call "We Have Hobbies," and this is where we talk about the things that we're doing this week that didn't have anything to do with gaming. Um, Nick, you mentioned you've been moving. Anything else in in your time you've been doing for leisure? Oh yeah, I've been uh, I've been working on I've got a 1969 Roadrunner, and I've actually started working on it again, trying to get it running. Clark Clark knows all about that car, and it's been <laughs> struggle to see the road. <laughs> Does it have any flames down the side? I, uh, you know, I didn't want to I didn't want to ride on 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 Clark's thunder there and take his thing. <laughs> <laughs> Not thunder, it's fire. <laughs> oh, my mistake. My mistake. <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. Alex, how about you? Uh, well, me and Trace are just looking for a house right now, so we're starting the process. Going to take a while. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's a process for sure. <laughs> <laughs> it's a process. I'm pretty sure this is going to be uh, my update for like every week for the next two months or so. <laughs> our house still. <laughs> Clark, Clark, how about you? You've been you've been doing a little uh, little traveling between yeah. states and stuff as well. I, have you had a chance to, to, to do much else? Um, no, not so much. The the one thing that well, I talked about it a little earlier. The one thing that seems to be happening to me um, is just my lack of battery. Issue. Oh, and lo and behold, I just got my ten percent battery warning right now. So <laughs> <laughs> um, three times over one weekend. So I guess. I may just be disconnected here pretty soon, so if I'm not here till the end, I'll 
give a little salute right now, just in case. <laughs> it's not a hobby of mine. It's just something that's happening. <laughs> <laughs> nice, nice. Yeah, I, I was kind of hoping that uh, we would have Evan on the show to talk about, uh, I think he went to a goat farm, which sounded interesting, as well as uh, Japan to, to visit some family and, and see some sights there. Uh, but I know I saw he was just leaving Tokyo um, earlier this morning, so probably not quite back to California yet. So hopefully we can have him on next week and hear about his Japanese adventures. Um, one thing I wanted to mention, and speaking of Tokyo, um, I listen to a lot of uh, books on on Audible, uh, audio books. Um, you know, I mean, when you're when you live in the Washington D.C. area, you spend a lot of time in your car, so. Uh, Tokyo Raider is a book that I listened to recently on Audible. It's a pretty quick listen. I imagine if it was in actual book form, it would be pretty short. Uh, but I think it's only maybe like a two to four hour listen. But a really cool book. It's kind of uh, like a samurai who learns to pilot a Voltron and fights some Russian created monster off the coast of Japan. Uh, definitely recommend it if if you like books like Ready Player One and and things like that. Probably worth listening to Tokyo Raider on on Audible. And so with that, I'm going to move on to towards our advice of the day. Uh, anybody have any any sage advice, tips, or or just general um, things to share with the listeners this week? Bring Nick, a I, I, bar moving out of an apartment. I mean, that's about all I got. A larger <laughs> truck. Bring any truck. Do not bring a small sports car. <laughs> <It's not laughs> for the proper that, vehicle for moving. Yeah, that that makes sense. And and so Alex, when you when you do find that house, don't don't try to move everything in a sports car. Uh, that's that's some pretty good advice right there. <laughs> <laughs> in, in case you couldn't figure that one out. <laughs> so so Alex, any any sage advice this week? Uh, uh I guess. Not really. I guess if you want to go gaming um, in Heroes of the Storm, I guess when I was talking about earlier about how you're always going to be in one-sided matches, you, you should probably, if you get tired of that, just find a hero that can carry. And by carry, I mean, if you're not familiar with MOBA terms, is somebody who's really weak at the beginning, but over time he gets so strong that he kind of just like wins the game for your team. Uh, so if you want to keep on winning, I Yeah, it's not yeah. as many, and there aren't as many as in other MOBAs. It's not the same thing, but there are a couple that you can go for, and these are usually high DPS heroes like Vala. Um, basically, that's it. <laughs> but, right. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah, that's good advice. I would I would say you know I mentioned I've been playing Helldivers, and I think something that people who are just starting out in that game may not do enough of is study the map. Uh, that would be my advice this week. When and there are two situations where you really want to study the map in that game. Number one, when you're selecting a landing zone, uh, your objectives are shown uh, on the map where you're going to be landing. And if you study the map when you're getting ready to select where you're going to drop in, uh, you really want to make sure that you study those objectives and you select stratagems that are appropriate for those objectives. So if you have a lot of objectives that are spread far apart, you want to get a tank so that you can get in a vehicle and quickly move between those objectives. If there are things that you got to blow up, you want to make sure you bring in something like a shredder missile. Again, the tank turret can blow up a lot of objectives, so that's helpful. Um, but for example, you know, if you're going to have to do a lot of defend objectives where you got to capture a point and defend it for a certain amount of time, you're better to bring in an arc turret, uh, like, like a regular machine gun turret, or there's an arc thrower turret. Um, things that stay in one position and defend an area. Uh, and then when you're moving around on the planet, if you look at the map, you can actually see red dots on the map and see where enemies are appearing. Uh, there are some stratagems that make doing that even easier and give you a little more visibility. There are even stratagems that let you uh, create a beacon in an area to attract enemies and distract them to an area. But really just look and see where they are as you're moving around on the planet and take the long way to an objective sometimes and avoid contact with the enemy, and you'll be glad you did, I think. And I think that's just going to about do it for us this week. And uh, Clark dropped off. I think his iPad finally died there. Um, so he'll be traveling traveling back to Hell's Kitchen and, and fighting some crime soon. And... Um, <laughs> I, I just wanted to let folks know, you know, we want to get feedback on the show. We want to 
keep promoting the show and make it better. So if you're listening, uh, whether you're listening to the live stream or you're listening uh, via iTunes as, uh, as a podcast or, or downloading from the website after the show, uh, go to iTunes, give us a five-star review, uh, tweet and post about the show using the hashtag the world map, and you can find us online. Uh, JoshuaDeLung.com is where I've been putting up the video and audio feeds in the show notes. Um, again, you can subscribe to us in the podcast app on, on iTunes, and every live broadcast gets archived to my YouTube channel after the show, which is youtube.com slash jdisasoldier. And... That's going to about wrap us up. I'm at Joshua DeLong on Twitter. Uh, Clark is at jclunk01. Uh, I'm Thunder Hokey, Thunder underscore Hokey on PS4. Um, did you guys have any any handles on, on Steam or PS4 or anything you wanted to give out to the listeners? Nah, not really. <laughs> <laughs> Nick, uh, I, I know you're you're just watching Netflix all the time anyway on your PS4, so it wouldn't do any good. <laughs> well, if you know somebody would invite me to a game there, I mean, maybe I'd play with them. Hey, download Helldivers and we're we're we'll get on it. No, I've, been, I've been considering it. I, I was actually highly considering that, but you know, when I was seeing you play, it was around finals time, so I might I might jump on that in the next week or so. Yeah, yeah, we should do that. All right, guys. Well, thanks for joining me again, and thanks to everybody who listened to the show this week. And until next time, we are popping smoke. <laughs>